So yeah, today's conversation is about uh, pigments across the biological scale. And then we have two speakers here, Mia and Kabir. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna introduce Mia, that uh, she's a microbiologist and biochemist and with massive passion for pigments, foraging and working with, as well as studying the history, science and cultural context of color and currents. Uh, she's a member of the PRI board and currently working in medical microbiology on novel antibiotics. So, and then of course, all the studies in PhD in molecular biotechnology, University of Leiden in Netherlands. Uh, she worked on intricate biochemical processes involved in the production of pigments compounds by soil bacteria. In addition to natural and microbial pigments, she's also interested in uh, the microorganisms that are associated with pigments, uh, sources and objects such as paintings. So um, that's, that's Mia, and then we have a Kabir, that's a, he's a currently a PhD student at the UBC, specializing in medical mycology and fun immunology. And his research centers on understanding how human pathogen fungi like cryptococcus neoformans uh, cause disease and interact with the host uh, in a adaptive uh, immune systems. Um, and also have interesting work in, in, in scientific Im image and microscopy, which is very nice to, to hear that, Kabir, that you, you get into this, the microscopy aspect of it. Uh, I find that super amazing. Uh, and then uh, currently he's working on building a community of microscopy enthusiasts and researchers to facilitate knowledge sharing. Uh, beyond the lab, he's a dedicated uh, to teach and mentoring. Um, and uh, he's find great fulfillment in facilitating workshops and mentoring students. Uh, so these are the two um, speakers, well, speakers for today's conversation. Um, I will just stop sharing here um, my, my screen and uh, I will ask Mia to start sharing her screen. And then after that, we're gonna have Kabir is presenting it as well. And after we're going to have a conversation, uh, we're going to step a little bit away from a traditional uh, uh, academic uh, lecture or, or seminar where here we 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 want, we value the, the conversation, the knowledge sharing. So please, uh, if you want to ask a question, just type in the chat or wait by the end of the second uh, conversation uh, we're gonna, you can unmute yourself and, and ask the question as well. All right, so uh, Mia, so the floor is all yours. Just, as, just a minute. Okay. Um, we can, you can also raise your hand if you click on reactions yeah. down at the bottom of your screen, it will allow you to raise your hand when you have a question, when, when our speakers are through today. That's correct, that's correct. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, Dr. Mia, please. <laughs> Thanks, Raphael, for the introduction. Uh, so today I want to talk about uh, microorganisms that are capable of producing color uh, that can be both dyes and pigments. I'll try and give you a very general idea of what microbes are and how they produce these colors and why. And this image uh, on my title slide, this is actually uh, part of a wall installation at Micropia. And this is uh, the first microbial zoo and it's in the Netherlands in Amsterdam. So if you're ever in the region, I can highly recommend visiting. It's really mind blowing what they have there. And it's already a nice uh, introduction to the sort of diversity uh, of color and shapes and all sorts of things that uh, microorganisms can do. Uh, so yeah, so this is a relatively well-known uh, example of microbes producing uh, color. This is uh, in Yellowstone in uh, the US. And this is actually a good example of uh, such densely packed population of uh, microorganisms so much so that you can actually see them in these, what they call uh, microbial mats. 
and they can produce all sorts of different colors. And um, what you can actually see here is that closest to this uh, water, the temperature is highest. And as you move away from uh, the, the source of heat, the diversity of these microorganisms starts changing and expanding and you start seeing more and more diversity and also different colors and uh, different kinds of chemicals being produced. But what are actually microbes? They're a group of uh, very varied uh, organisms that are generally um, not visible uh, by eye. Uh, that includes bacteria and archaea and protozoa, even some forms of algae are considered microorganisms, various types of fungi, including uh, molds uh, and also viruses. And in most cases, these are invisible to the eye. But here, this is an example of how we uh, grow uh, microorganisms in the lab. So this is a handprint. And in general, you won't notice or see that you have any sort of microorganisms growing on your hand. But if you press it to this, um, what we call growth media, solid media on which they can grow, you can see that with time, these colonies uh, will form. And already here, you can see that there's a great diversity in forms and colors and shapes. So it just shows you how, um, despite them being invisible, they are all around us. And not all of them are uh, harmful. The majority are actually even beneficial and essential for a healthy lifestyle. So the way we can look at microorganisms, obviously with a microscope. So this is an example from a paper where uh, here on the left, you can see a single cell of a bacteria. And if we grow it, uh, so as we call it growing on the solid media, what actually happens is that this, this uh, bacterium starts multiplying and it starts creating these colonies that are um, a whole, collection of lots of bacterial cells together. And that's actually what you see on these kind of uh, plates on um, petri dish plates. So I wanted to give also an example of how we're able to see the invisible without a microscope. So this is an example of uh, one of these uh, solid uh, media plates. And what you'll see first is only the solid media, the agar that it's growing on. Uh, and slowly you'll start visualizing bacteria that's growing um, on this plate. So um, this is a Pseudomonas species. You can see here at first you see nothing and slowly you start seeing the bacteria, the colonies emerging. And with time, it even starts producing this pigment. So that's the way in which we can uh, culture uh, microorganisms and identify them in the lab and uh, explore in the different ways that they produce color. So, um, so this is an example of a colleague of mine. Um, here, uh, there's a, they were able to access um, a closed off cave that hadn't been um, explored by humans before. And they collected, back in this case, bacteria from uh, the walls of this cave. And this is what they call uh, moon milk deposits. Uh, mostly limestone and other kinds of chemicals are, are found in this um, material. And here, uh, there's a selection of actually all sorts of different bacteria that they were able to isolate from there. So. Again, in the, each of these examples, you can see the plate with the bacteria growing. And here on the top right, they also show a single colony, what it looks like. And in a lot of the cases, you can see that there's different colors and also a wide variety of colors. And um, so one of the things we can do is look at uh, and look for a lot of different microbes that produce these colors. But to really understand why they produce color, we can also uh, examine a single type of bacteria more closely. And that is what a lot of my work 
focused on one single uh, bacteria, but with a very colorful chemistry. And that's uh, the soil bacteria called Streptomyces silicolor. And silicolor uh, translates as color of the sky uh, because it produces a blue color like the sky. It also produces a lot of other interesting things, including jasmine, which is the characteristic earthy smell of soil that you'll encounter when you go for a walk in the woods, for example. So this is an example of uh, some of my work here on the left. And in comparison to the previous example where there was a lot of different types of bacteria producing a lot of different types of color, what I did was to try and understand how the chemistry and biology of this one type of bacteria is able to produce so many different colors and trying to find the conditions that it needs in order to actually produce these colors because they aren't produced just uh, under all conditions. They, they need specific um, activation signals, as we call them. So Streptomyces silicolor and related bacteria are very, uh, very powerful chemical factories. And in this example, by supplying different nutrients and influencing the chemistry that takes place within the cell, we can get these different colors to show up. Um, and this is all from one single type of bacteria. So Streptomyces, as I said, are very powerful factories. Um, they're used for a lot of industrial uses, but also a lot of medical uses. And actually all the colors that you see in this example, these are mostly made by a blue colored and a red colored antibiotic. And this type of bacteria, the streptomyces, are actually uh, the source of the majority of all our antibiotics. So they're very important to human health and industry. And each type of this streptomyces bacteri bacteria on average can produce around 20 different chemicals, and some of these are colorful. So I've been talking about um, color from nature uh, by discovering mm -hmm. types of uh, microorganisms with interesting colors. But towards the end there, I also started discussing more about um, designing interesting colors in, in the lab rather than just finding uh, these colors in, in the environment. So uh, one of the major benefits of biotechnology and uh, microbial pigments and dyes is actually that they can generally be produced in a much more eco-friendly way. So uh, there's a lot of examples of biotechnology. Um, it's not as modern as most people might think. It's an ancient uh, technology, which I chose this picture of cheese as an example of because um, producing cheese is actually by design. It's a form of biotechnology. So if we consider pigments and dyes by design, um, indigo fermentation is actually also one of these ancient technologies that um, in 2500 uh, BC, there was the first indigo dyed textiles that were dated to that time. And in Peru, even uh, even earlier than that, there's now evidence for 4,000 BC um, materials that were dyed with indigo. And I won't go into the chemistry and everything else um, that's involved in the production of indigo, but I do want to highlight that microbes are actually essential for this uh, process. So this is the indigo plant um, and the, the chemicals that are within the plant um, get modified by oxidative degradation and you get this uh, sukumo uh, material, which is actually the compact uh, composted plant material. And this is actually already indigo. And uh, microorganisms are essential for composting this material. This is uh, the method that's used in Japan. And from there, you need um, a reduction of the indigo. So by fermentation, you create this fermentation liquid, which um, enables you to create uh, a soluble compound that can actually dye 
the material you want to dye, which then gets uh, reverted back to indigo uh, after our exposure to air. But this, the various steps in this process, what's important to highlight here is that um, actually microorganisms are central to this process. And this is a, a, a very ancient process uh, that's been used for thousands of years. But currently in industry, a lot of these steps have actually been replaced with harsh chemicals, which are um, very damaging to the environment. So that's a huge problem. Um, so actually what we want to do is go back to a cleaner technology. So we want to go back to the microbial um, production of indigo. And there's different ways we can do that. And um, in 2018, uh, there was a paper published as one of the many examples uh, where they were able to produce, fully produce indigo without the need of even uh, the indigo plant. They were able to produce indigo uh, with a bacteria. And so this also doesn't then require these harsh toxic chemicals. So here you can see again a plate uh, like before, and you can see that the, the bacteria have a bluish color. That's the indigo being produced. And they were also able to um, extract this indigo from the cells. Here, there's another example from 2002 by uh, Lee. So what they did was actually um, by understanding the chemistry that uh, the microorganisms use and how they use it, they were able to create variations of indigo and create a whole range of different colors by just changing small areas of the chemistry involved in the indigo. So you can see that with small modifications in the chemistry and by understanding the chemistry, we can do a lot with even a single um, color. Another example is uh, biogenic ochre production. So um, ochre that's produced by bacteria. Um, this is an example from a recently published thesis. So you can see in there's a, all over the world there, you'll find these streams with a sort of orangey or reddish uh, color uh, and a sort of oily sheen on them. And this is usually um, produced by these bacteria that produce ochre. And here is a, microsco um, a microscopy photo which shows these two types of bacteria. I'm not gonna try and pronounce their names. Um, there's the swirly one and the rod shapes here. And actually what happens is that both these bacteria, they produce these sort of filaments, these rods, and these rods are actually made of uh, biogenic ochre. And uh, Brandy McDonald analyzed some ancient rock paintings. And what they actually found is, found is that the ochre used in these painting was, paintings was biogenic ochre. And this is an example from this publication. And you can see that by different heat treatments, they could get different colors of ochre from the same bacterial source. So there's no single answer to why microorganisms make pigments and dyes. Um, the reasons are very diverse and there's no single chemistry or single reason because microorganisms come from different habitats and uh, different environments, which also means that the chemistry that they use is very different. So this is an example of some very extreme environments where uh, microorganisms have been found. That includes, for example, per permafrost and um, the hot springs, like I showed in one of the first slides. So these are all very extreme environments where generally we don't expect <clears throat> to find any life. But um, what's interesting is that actually a lot of the microorganisms that are found uh, in these harsh environments, they're also some of the biggest producers of color in the microbial world. And one of the 
reasons is probably for protection and resistance, for example, resistance to uh, heavy metals and things like that. But it, they don't only produce them for surviving harsh uh, habitats. Um, we suspect that some of the, the pigments and dyes are actually used for communication. So they're signals that can be sent between organisms in the habit, habitat. They can also be defense for defensive uh, purposes, such as antibiotics and also for virulence. So they could be toxic because they're used in um, attacking, for example, other um, other microorganisms. And there's also uh, evidence for the pigments being um, used for acquisition of nutrients and energy. So in other words, actually, it's not so much, in most cases, it's not so much that they produce pigments and dyes, it's more that they produce a very diverse um, set of chemicals, and some of these uh, are pigmented and potentially very interesting uh, for us. So, um, sort of bringing everything back together again, um, I hope you can appreciate that microbes are really efficient manufacturers of a lot of chemicals, and uh, that includes colors. Uh, but they're also exceptional recyclers. And this is just an example um, of a tree. And uh, you can see that the leaves start falling from the tree. And in this case, there's a drawing of a mushroom, but this also, so fungi, but this also includes other microorganisms. And they're important for actually tidying up what's here labeled as litter. So the debris and the organic material that's no longer needed, that's recycled by these microorganisms. And in turn, the, the tree also has beneficial um, interactions in return, for example, by supplying um, moisture and regulating the temperature and things like that. So, um, all these organisms are part of a whole ecosystem. They're not uh, isolated and independent of other uh, living material and organisms and things um, like they are in the lab. But what you can see here is that this uh, recycling and production is just very important for um, the whole circle of life and for um, for just uh, maintaining a healthy uh, environment. And one of the reasons that uh, these microorganisms are also very important in industry is because they can degrade a lot of complex chemicals um, that we can then uh, use for our benefit. And one of the ideas is that actually, um, oh, sorry, is that probably uh, some of these compounds, like the antibiotics, are probably made in an effort to protect the nutrients that they're recycling and sharing and the communication between the organisms that are in their environment. So the whole system is very complicated, but uh, there's really a lot of interesting things uh, to still discover. And this is actually um, a major focus now of a lot of biotechnology is uh, towards sustainable and circular production and industry. And that also includes color. But um, to sort of uh, bring it back also to the title of my talk and everything, this image and this whole process also always reminds me of a lot of old um, drawings from, um, alchemy books uh, where also the whole, this whole idea and process of recycling and circular um, processes uh, was central. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, all the colorful microbes I showed you today. Thanks Mia was very, very nice. And uh, let's go to Kabir's talk and then we'll have afterwards a time for uh, Q&A. Kabir.
Right. Um, thanks, um, everyone, for taking the time out to uh, attend these. Really appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to be speaking about a completely different domain. We're going to go to eukaryotes. And we're going to look at fungi um, specifically. So I've titled this talk, Melanin and Beyond, The World of Fungal Pigments. Um, my work in my PhD is specifically looking at the pigment melanin in the context of virulence. So how do fungal pathogens use molecules like melanin to cause disease? But today we'll expand on that and go a little bit further and look at all the other pigments that, that um, fungi, both microscopic and macroscopic, produce in the, in the environment. Um, I also want to acknowledge that a lot of the photographs of mushrooms that you will see today, they've been generously provided by my friends as a part of a HIFL network that we have here at the University of British Columbia. And this picture here is a Dyer's polypore. Um, it's called Dyer's polypore because uh, a lot of pigments can be extracted from this mushroom and can be used to dye um, fabrics of different kinds. And we'll, we'll get into this a little bit later in the, in the talk. Um, so with that, we can get started. Um, a lot of times when uh, we look at mushrooms, especially the ones that grow here in the Pacific Northwest, um, they have this really dark brown color. Um, it ranges from dark brown to black, and turns out that this is because of a pigment known as melanin. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with melanin, as this is the same pigment that is found in our skin, and it gives us our eye, hair, and skin color. So that same pigment is actually found in fungi. Um, and these are some mushrooms that we have foraged uh, recently uh, this year. And not all of them are edible, but um, I just like to look at all sorts of different fungi that are um, Pacific Northwest and um, really just create a map or sort of a living dex for all the fungi that, that do grow. So what is melanin? I've talked about melanin a lot, but what is melanin? It's, a, it's an ancient brown or black biological pigment, and it's found across all life forms. You'll find bacteria that produce melanin, fungi produce a lot of melanin as well, and then of course mammals like ourselves, we also have melanin in, in, in different uh, parts. One of the biggest challenges with melanin is it's very difficult to isolate from natural sources in large quantities. So we can't get a lot of melanin um, from these natural sources. So what we've done um, and what researchers and biotechnologists have done is they produce this melanin artificially in the lab or in the industry. And it's quite a complex and expensive process. And we'll look into some of those steps later in this presentation. And unfortunately, the product that we get as a part of this process is not the same as natural melanin. We lose a lot of those functions and a lot of those structural components when we synthesize this melanin artificially. So there is a need uh, to extract the natural melanin from the microbes. So here, this image, panel B, is showing you a culture of organisms that are producing melanin. So see that dark black pigment? Uh, that can be isolated from microbes, but it's a very difficult process. What I also want to highlight here is that melanin is about 10 times more expensive than gold. And it's mostly because it's so difficult to get it from, from these natural sources. But there is, a, there is some good news. We have recently discovered mushrooms that produce thousand times more melanin than any other known fungi. Um, and these mushrooms grow in the Pacific Northwest. They're commonly found in the forests of British Columbia. In fact, we have seen them growing on campus where, where I work. Um, these mushrooms are called Armillaria sepistites, and um, new technology and new protocols are being actively developed to isolate melanin from this fungus. The biggest thing that I want to highlight on this slide is that this mushroom actually secretes this melanin. What that means is that melanin is not locked inside the fungal cell wall. It is actually actively thrown out by the mushroom so we can use this melanin for a lot of different things, especially for water purification. So another really cool thing about melanin is it can soak up heavy metals. So contaminants like cadmium or other heavy metals that are found in the environment can be taken up by melanin so that the water that's that's 
um, that's left after that treatment is actually safe for human consumption. So that is something that melanin can do. And melanin can also be added as a um, uh, added in paints and stains to preserve wood from damage um, because of its other properties. The big question that I often get from students and um, as well as other folks is why are fungi and other microbes making melanin? And Mia did a fantastic job in her presentation talking about um, the functions of, of, of these uh, pigments. But the biggest reason why melanin is produced or is thought to be produced by these microbes is because it protects these microbes from other organisms in the environment. It protects from UV radiation. So the same function that melanin in our skins does where it protects us from the, from, the, from the UV radiation coming from the sun. It is also thought to be helpful in protecting these organisms from any ecological stress and also helps them regulate their temperature. Um, in the field where I am um, working in currently, pathogenesis or fungal pathogenesis, melanin is really important for causing disease. If an organism like Cryptococcus neoformans does not produce melanin, there's very little chance that it will be able to cause disease in the host. Um, melanin also protects these organisms from our immune system. So if there is no melanin, our immune system can easily clear out these infections um, and, and um, help the host recover. This is a transmission electron micrograph showing you melanin in the outer structures of the cell. Uh, so this is what I was talking about when I said that melanin is locked and cannot be used very easily. So what, what that essentially looks like is this melanin is in this layer and not secreted, so you can't actually use it. But the mushroom that we talked about earlier can actually secrete that melanin so we can use it for our purposes. Um, the pathogen that I work on in my research is called Cryptococcus neoformans, and it's a basidiomycete yeast. Uh, it's coming from the same group as many mushrooms, and it's responsible for um, very um, light-threatening infections in immunocompromised people, so people who have uh, immune systems that are not functioning properly. Um, the disease that I study in my work is cryptococcosis, um, and it can show up as a lung-specific disease, so pulmonary cryptococcosis, where it only spreads to the lung, or in other cases, it can uh, travel to your brain um, and surrounding tissues and cause infection there. And these yeasts are typically responsible for doing that. These yeasts also produce a lot of melanin, um, and that melanin helps them survive in the brain and cause more disease. Anyway, coming back from, from um, my work in pathogenesis, let's think about pigments a little bit more uh, concretely. If we are able to isolate this melanin from natural sources, what can we do with it? Turns out melanin can be used for a lot of different things. First of all, it can be used as a food colorant. So we can remove the artificial food coloring agents that are currently being used and replace them with natural melanin. Melanin can also be used in a lot of different industries and can act as a semiconductor for a lot of electronic applications. Another really fun thing about melanin is it's an antioxidant, which means it can take up all the damaging reactive oxygen species and soak them up and prevent them from hurting um, the host or the human bodies. So it can be used as an antioxidant agent in a lot of pharmaceutical drugs. Recently, it was also discovered that it can tackle some of the venom from um, different reptiles. So there is a potential use for melanin as an anti-venom um, um, in, in these particular cases. And overall, it has antibacterial and antiviral properties, so it can also protect against some of those bacterial and viral infections. And this is something that got me really, really excited. Turns out that there's research going on right now where uh, researchers are studying the use of melanin in hair dyes. So folks who are, uh, who are going a little gray in their hair, they can use uh, these natural or artificial melanin dyes to to recover that hair color. Um, it's still in re it's still in early stages of research, so we don't have this product out in the market yet. But it is better than the ammonia based hair dyes that are available at the moment, and it can actually stay on hair a little bit longer. It can withstand um, multiple washes. So something to consider. It might be on the market soon. Who knows? 
Um, melanin is also currently being tested out in a lot of different um, ointments and lotions where it can protect from UV radiation, but it's also being used as a treatment for um, um, burns and any sort of heat damage. So that is another application of melanin that is showing up and research is being actively done in this area. Um, I also want to give a shout out to all the other pigments that fungi produce. And there's a whole other world. So it goes beyond melanin. There's all these different colors that show up in fungi that I want to highlight. So if you have time, I highly recommend checking out this beautiful website called the Mushroom Color Atlas. Um, and this has been put together by Julie Beeler. Um, and I spent a lot of time on this website because it's just so beautiful and gives you so much information about different mushrooms and what kinds of colors you can extract from these mushrooms to dye fabrics. So check this website out if you get a chance. Um, it's a resource for everyone who's curious about mushrooms and is looking to um, use those pigments for staining fabrics um, and, and doing other cool things with those pigments. It can also be used as paint. Uh, we'll talk about this particular mushroom called Hypomyces lactiflorum. It's the lobster mushroom. It's not a lobster. It's not a mushroom, but we'll talk more about it in just a minute. Um, often when folks think about fungi and fungal pigments, they think of mushrooms. Um, and what happens in this process is we forget about molds. Um, so that's why I've, I've um, highlighted them as the unsung heroes of this vibrant world, because we can get so many pigments from these molds. If you just take a walk to your pantry or fridge and find something spoiled, you'll probably see mold on there, on that food. It'll probably be very brightly colored. Turns out we can extract pigments from those brightly colored molds and use them for a wide variety of applications. So here um, I've shown Fusarium. There's also Aspergillus. This is a common, common mold that you often get when food is spoiled. Um, when I was putting this presentation together, I learned about monascus. Apparently, it's a mold that uh, takes over uh, rice grains and turns them this red, rust, orangish color. Um, and you can extract a lot of pigments out of this. And this is this is pretty recent. And there's a lot of work that's going into um, making this process a lot more efficient at the industrial scale so we can get a lot of pigment out of it. Um, and use it in different um, food um, products. But you can get pigments like beta carotene, azathlones, quinones, ancoflavins, and they range from these orange, pink, yellow, red colors. We also um, can isolate pink and purple colors out of, out of these molds. I haven't shown those molecules here, but just know that there's a, there's a lot of potential um, um, from, from um, filamentous fungi like these. The overall goal for a lot of this work that is being done is to take synthetic artificial pigments that are currently being used in food and replace them with these natural colors and pigments so it's safer for consumption and um, overall um, safe for use. Um, I also recently discovered that fungi are the main source from which pigments are being isolated today. A lot of work is going into um, these filamentous fungi um, and trying out different methods to extract these pigments. And I was really surprised to find out that a lot of these pigments are actually coming from marine fungi, so fungi that grow in the ocean. Um, and a lot of these pigments are melanin-like. They're not quite melanin, but they're melanin-like. Um, so for example, these are black yeasts. They're from the same phylum as penicillin and aspergillus, so they're ascomycetes. Um, and turns out that you can also get good yields of this pigment. Um, from these yeasts. Uh, I'm not going to go over details of how this experiment was done or what each of these uh, individual treatments are, um, but this is just um, showing a method for extraction um, of, of these pigments. I also want to highlight all the mushroom dyes that um, are available and things that you can do with all sorts of mushrooms. A lot of the mushrooms that you will see here, um, they are very common in the Pacific Northwest. So Dyer's polypore, um, uh, we talked about it when we started this presentation, but this Dyer's polypore can give you a range of colors um, and you can use those colors to, to dye different fabrics. So here um, there's different fabrics that are colored with uh, different uh, shades and that's possible because 
uh, different mordants have been used. Essentially, mordants is a substance that can lock the color into a fabric, and you can use different types of mordants to achieve different colors in these fabrics. And if you want more information on how to dye your own fabric, how much mushroom to use, what kind of um, uh, Morden to use, you can get that on this website, Bloom and Dye. This is again compiled by Julie Beeler. And there's a lot of information if you're starting out uh, staining fabrics with mushrooms. I highly, highly recommend that you go check this website out. I might even try out some next uh, next fall when we mm -hmm. go back to the mushroom season. Um, there's a couple other mushrooms um, that are also very, very popular and they can also be used as sources for these stains, specifically this lobster mushroom. Once again, I want to highlight, this is not a lobster, it's not a mushroom. The orange color that you're seeing here is actually coming from a mold that is colonizing the mushroom. The mushroom itself is white in color. It does not have many pigments, but once it's colonized by this mold, this orange colored mold, you can extract pigments and use it as a dye for different fabrics. And it can give you a range of colors from orange, red, browns, um, uh, and so on. Um, there's also chicken of the woods. I'm not sure if folks are familiar with this. This is a this, this is quite a prized mushroom for its flavor. It tastes like chicken when um, you fry it up like fried chicken. But turns out you can also extract lots of colors, lots of pigments from this mushroom. Um, and it'll give you these, these orange um, shades for, um, for staining. Um, a lot of the work that um, is, going, um, is going on right now is focused on isolating these pigments and using it um, for food products. So filamentous fungi are currently being used on large scale to produce these pigments and colorants for the food industry. But there are some problems, there are some challenges, and I thought that it was a good idea to address those challenges in this talk. One of the biggest problems and in, um, in, in this process is really the per public perception of products. Think about molds that are spoiling your food. We're essentially removing pigments and colors from them to add them to the food. So obviously there, there are some concerns um, about uh, public perception there. Right? It's very difficult to convince folks that we're using pigments from molds and putting them into, into the food. Um, there's also a concern of contamination with mycotoxins. So fungi produce a lot of different toxins um, and they have different reasons for producing these toxins. But often when we isolate these pigments, sometimes our pigments can be contaminated with mycotoxins. But I want to highlight that there's a lot of work that's going in into identifying um, these toxins and, and removing them from, from the process of isolating pigments. There's also limited availability, like we talked about melanin earlier. It's very difficult to extract some of these pigments on a large scale. Um, and there's also some concern surrounding instability when the, these pigments are exposed to light. So they change colors if they're exposed to light for too long. And work is being done to synthetically modify those natural compounds to make them more stable um, and more soluble in, in water. Um, I wanted to uh, highlight some of the pigments that are already available for use, and they have been isolated from uh, filamentous fungi and molds. Um, one example of this is our pink red. It, it comes from this uh, fungus known as Penicillium oxalicum. Um, penicillium is uh, the genus where we got penicillin, the antibiotic from, so hopefully that the name um, uh, is, is familiar. Um, but we were able to isolate this, this pigment called our pink red um, from this fungus, and it's currently being used in a lot of food products like candies and sodas. What I also want to highlight is there is an Argentinian company that is currently working on creating additional pigments from fungi. And what this pigment will do is it'll replace the pigments we're currently getting from the shells of insects. So right now, a lot of the red pigments that we're getting in the market, they're coming from um, the hard chitinous shells of, of um, different insects. So this will um, replace those, um, those pigments. So that's some exciting work. I also wanted to highlight, highlight beta carotene production from this fungus known as Blakeslea trispora. Um, it is also quite exciting. It gets that orange, that really rich orange color um, that is also being used in a lot of different food products. And turns out, and this is a little fun thing about um, the biology of fungi, you often need both 
mating types. So um, and this is mating type one, this is mating type two. They have to mate in order for you to get some of these pigments. Um, so that's how this orange color, the beta carotene pigment is being produced um, in an industry at a large scale right now. The last thing that I wanna highlight is the complications associated with creating and isolating these pigments. I, I want to highlight and I want to appreciate that isolating pigments is a very complicated process. Just look at this flow chart. There's so many different steps that are involved in getting that pigment at the end. So that beta carotene at the end requires so many steps and so many considerations. And a lot of the work um, right now in biotech companies is going into optimizing each of these steps so you can get a lot of beta, beta carotene at the end, um, a lot of safe beta carotene at the end that then you can use in a lot of different applications. And new biotechnological methods are being created and developed all the time. So that is the work that's happening constantly behind the scenes. Um, I also wanted to highlight that the stuff that we do in lab differs entirely from what's happening at the industrial scale. When we say that we're scaling things up, it's often quite complicated. It's not just increasing the amounts. There's there's a lot more to consider uh, when this process happens. So if I were doing this in a lab, I would grow my um, yeasts or grow my cultures in this you know five mil to 10 mil volume. Turns out when you scale things up, you're dealing with 200 liters of culture and you're extracting pigments from 200 liters up to 200 liters of culture. So a lot of different things have to be considered, including aeration, um, agitation, temperature, all of these things, they come into play when you are working with um, such large cultures um, and such large volumes. Um, so just wanted to highlight that that process is a lot more complicated and requires a lot more um, uh, steps. With that, um, we're at the end of this talk. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you learned something new and thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Kabir. It was very, very nice. Very exciting to see some of the photographs taken uh, at UBC. <laughs> uh, that was very nice to see that. So uh, let's begin with the question, uh, the Q&A session here. So I would say uh, Melanie would like to, to start or begin with the questions. Yeah. Our first question um, it asks, what about Cryptococcus neoformans and its effects on the immune system? I can take that question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so much that um, Cryptococcus does to the host immune system. So um, I'll speak very briefly. We can have an hour long conversation about what it does to the host immune system. But um, essentially there's damage that's happening at multiple levels. So at cellular level, it's targeting macrophages and other immune cells. And at the tissue level, it is targeting e entire organs like lungs and, uh, and brain. Hopefully that answers some of, some of that question. Um, and they're, they're not, giving us names anymore they're just giving us initials so um dh says thank you and un says thanks for all those leads so does anybody have any other questions there's one for me here oh here i see this is a big one the okay, the sheen seen on active indigo vats and the oily sheen associated with biogenic ochre production. Is there much research about the possibility of the bacteria creating structural color on the surface of the water? And are these related? Um, so I'm not sure about those two specific examples, but I know that there is a bacterial species that I think it was even recently published it does create sort of hexagon shapes um, in its colonies as it's growing. And these do produce this structural color and it's sort of this iridescent looking color. And so it could be, I'm not sure for these specific ones because in a lot of cases, 
Um, these are also um, a mix of different microorganisms. It's not one single one. But in this case, they studied this one type of bacteria and you could really see that it's very structural and it changes with the light and everything. So it, it was in the way that the biological units were constructed. Okay. Um, one of the things that that I recently learned and I don't know, I haven't had a chance to test it out is sometimes you'll see a puddle or a stream that has this the reddish orange stuff in it and you you don't know if it's you know something that's toxic or if it's biogenic ochre and i was told that if you put your finger in it and and pull your finger out that if it's biogenic ochre it will stay separated if it's not biogenic ochre and that you know, space where your finger was closes up, that it's something else that you probably do not want to lick. Um, Jill, you've got your hand up. I wondered, I thought I might come on and actually ask this in person. Um, <laughs> uh, fantastic kind of follow on, I guess. Um, and Melanie, that really made me think, I, I gathered a whole bunch of biogenic ochres with a whole bunch of my bummer colleagues in Cape Ooh. York this year. And we actually got chased out of a creek by a clean skin bull to get them, which was fun. It's a whole other story. <laughs> um, so, so my question is actually, uh, not necessarily just about biogenic ochres, but about the stability of pigments. And it's probably for both of the speakers. So full disclosure, I'm an archaeologist, so I'm interested in things lasting for a really long time, right? Because otherwise uh, I don't get to study them. So um, for both of you, there probably seems to be quite a bit of ephemeralness, if that's a word, to um, some of the pigments. So apart from roasting things to be able to stabilise those pigments, I wondered if you could talk to us about some of the other mechanisms for stabilising some of those pigments in the fungi and in the, um, and in the microbes. Well, um, that's the tricky thing. It really depends on what the chemical is. In a lot of cases, it is what you would consider a dye. Uh, in which case it's not going to be stable. Uh, there are exceptions, of course, but um, as with general uh, other botanical dyes, for example, and mineral pigments, it really depends on the chemical structure and what's being produced. And then in some cases, I'm sure there's modifications you could do to stabilize it further, but that really sort of depends on your starting material and what that is. So um there's not really a single answer clear-cut answer to that because it really depends what you start with so for example that biogenic ochre will stay stable and maybe change a bit in color um, as you change um the the temperature and things like that but um it really depends what it is uh for a lot of these microorganisms coming from extreme environments because they have to deal with extreme environments, some of them will ha make chemicals that are a lot more stable um, at the extremes. But for example, if you isolated something from um, permafrost, that will not necessarily um, that will not necessarily stay stable. Maybe during heating, for example, it all sort of depends on what the chemistry is. I think Mia you captured have a that response to that. Yeah, I think Mia captured that perfectly. Um, I might not have a lot of things to add there, and I really wish I had more formal training in synthetic chemistry to be able to answer that. Um, but like Mia said, adding just uh, additional uh, groups to these molecules uh, might help with stability. Um, my experience comes from staining fungi for for uh, research purposes, and what we usually do to protect. Um, those molecules from degradation or um, instability is we add a layer of protective um, mountain and that can also help. I don't know how you will be able to do that for paints, um, but perhaps adding another chemical uh, entirely to, to sort of protect um, the, the molecule from degradation. Thank you. Jill, remind me to tell you about um, alcohol. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, for stabilizers for like ancient paints, um, you know, it's usually plant based stuff, or sometimes there'll be another mineral that's added in. But we, yeah, I, I spent sort of 20 years looking at mineral pigments because I didn't think that anything biological would survive in the archaeological record. And all of the research I've done in the last five years tells me I couldn't be more wrong. So yeah, it's really amazing what's now um, the importance of microorganisms and other organisms in sort of geology and geochemistry is really becoming a huge field. There's even a completely emerging field now, I forgot what it's called, like some something sedimentary where they're isolating DNA from geological samples and it's preserved so they can sort of see what the sources are. It's also been used for pigment uh, source identification. So where a pigment came from that's been used somewhere. So yeah, I've got a few questions about that that I actually want to talk to you about at some point, Mia, because I'd like to check some of that because I think it, I think it's probably got legs, but I think that particular study you're talking about was the application was problematic. Yeah, it could be. I haven't looked at that in detail either, but I, I have seen that it's an emerging field beyond ochre and things like that. So, uh, yeah, sure. We'll talk. OK, next question um, for Mia. Can you talk about the Woolly Mammoth Microorganism Project? Do you have any published material on the subject? So we have a preprint, which I've linked, and I've, I'm just quickly trying to open some uh, images so I can show you. Um, uh, let me just see. So this was um, a big project that we did. So this was a, uh, a mammoth was found intact in Siberia, and I'll just share my screen again. And did it have any vivianite on it? I'm not sure. I, unfortunately, I didn't get to see the actual oh. <laughs> <laughs> samples. So uh, we were able to get some uh, samples from inside the the mammoth around it as well. And this was a collaboration with researchers in Siberia and different universities in the Netherlands. So this is where in this picture, you can see that they were um, taking tissue samples. So we've also been doing genomic studies, looking at the DNA. And this is an example of some of the um, uh, microorganisms that uh, we isolated. Um, this is a picture from the, uh, from the publication, the preprint. So you can see that even there, there's sort of a variety of colors being uh, identified. And what we're seeing is that we're identifying some probably ancient uh, ancestors of some of the microorganisms that are, were, are well known uh, already now. And so we're very excited also to see how these might have changed, how has resistance to antibiotics changed and what kind of compounds they produce. And as a last thing, I thought I'd show this. This is uh, my attempt at bio art, which didn't work out as well as I'd hoped, but this is, um, I tried to uh, draw a woolly mammoth with some of the different microorganisms we isolated. So there's this typically gray one, like the streptomyces that I worked on before, this white one and a black one here. So, uh, and you can see that even like around the, there's like this halo of color around the drawing. And these are all these pigmented compounds that are being uh, produced. I think we have a new medium for art. Oh, I can show you more. There, it's a whole. There's a whole competition. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. I was going to include it, but then I, I, yeah, I was going to include it in my talk, and then I got like distracted with everything else, and thought, <laughs> okay, it'll become <laughs> too much. But I can just share it like this. So, I hope it's. Oh wow. Oh, so th I mean, people do amazing things. Like that was my attempt, but I mean, like, look at this. Like, this is not. This is unbelievable. I mean, yeah. most years, I we would all draw like for Christmas and things. Like, um, we would write things in the agar and write notes. But there's whole competitions, and some of them are bio uh, luminescent, for example. So you can make like glow in the dark art and things like that so uh, and this is agar from seaweed correct uh probably it 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 will vary i mean um there's different types but yeah mostly 
they can use any sort. And actually, the Micropia website, which I'm, oh. uh, which I mentioned before, is actually a really great resource if you do want to try some stuff on on uh, at home. So they have a lot of great information about microbes and how tiny they really are and the kind of things they do. But they also have experiments you can do at home. So uh, you can see, like, for example, how to make your own micro zoo. So this is a quite classic example. Um, there's, let's see, making yogurt. Um, let's see. Uh, culture your own microorganisms. So it tells you actually how uh, you can I make I thought them. I was doing that in my refrigerator. Probably you don't really need agar. I mean, uh, one of one of my uh, colleagues, um, I think he maybe even uh, published a paper on it. He was he started studying the the micro microbes that were uh, forming on like soup and things that were left out, um, and then he started collecting them from like different types of soup and from <laughs> colleagues and things and isolating what's there and everything. So, I mean. I, what, one of the things I, I love about the microbial world as well is that you can start with something that maybe doesn't look very exciting, like a lump of soil that's just brown or whatever, and that's right in your garden. And it'll some of the organisms can produce the most amazing colors. But equally, you can go to these places like like volcanoes and things where really life should not be able to exist. And even there, there's life finds a way and life finds a way to be creative. So there's so much diversity and options and, and things like from, from the places that seem mundane to even space and the most uh, elaborate places. So, yeah. Um, we've got a question for Kabir. What particular microorganisms first got you interested in dyes and pigments? And can you recommend any particular microorganisms to look out for that would be intriguing for an amateur microbial pigment enthusiast? I That's... love that. An amateur microbial pigment enthusiast. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question. I got so excited when I first saw it. Um, <laughs> so... I had a really fun time in my undergraduate degree. I took a lot of courses that were within my discipline, but also outside. And I, I took these two courses that, you know, stuck with me. One of them was uh, this course on environmental soil microbiology, where we would just take samples from the soil or blueberry leaves or blueberry roots, and we would just plate them and see what shows up. Um, one of the things that showed up there was Pseudomonas, which um, um, you could look under a UV light and it would glow. But there were also lots of other colonies that we found and they were colorful, especially the purple ones. Um, the other course I took, which really got me excited about pigments, was microbial ecophysiology, where we were looking at microbial communities in a bunch of different environments, including marine environments, soil environments. And that's the first time I learned about purple sulfur bacteria. And then I learned that not all purple sulfur bacteria are purple. They're different colors. So I think that's um, what really got me thinking about pigments and all the colors that these microbes are, are, are producing. So the microbes that I would um, recommend to start looking into is actually a whole group. It's the, the purple sulfur bacteria. See what, what shows up for you there. Uh, Rhodococcus is another a really cool organism that produces these uh, red colonies. Um, I, I feel that I won't have a lot of recommendations for microbes. I'm more on the on the fungal macrofungal side. Uh, um, so essentially any mushrooms that are blue or purple that pop up for me are, are things that really get me excited. And I would like to learn more about, about those as well. Maybe I can add a bit to that. Um... For example, that one of those slides where I showed the handprint, I mean, that's just what's living on your hand. And one of the things that we see is that um, most microbes have the capability to, to produce more colors than we see under whatever set condition we've tested. And that's one of the challenges. But um, for example, like even in your kitchen, you can find some like 
there's the the aspergillus black fungus that Kabir talked about, which I have also worked on, that you can usually find it between the skin of the onions. And um, some of the things we sometimes also do during our uh, labs and things is just take samples of soil or your finger or like the doorknob and just play that out <laughs> on the agar and see what grows. So um, it is important to remember that they're not all necessarily gonna like with with um, disease causing and problem causing microbes, usually it's not their game, their game, their aim to get you sick but wrong place, wrong time is the thing to remember. So they're not all going to be uh, friendly microbes, but um, I think you just in your environment or anywhere special, uh, you can find a lot of stuff. And uh, I, personally, I'm trying now to figure out how to get some microbes out of, for example, rocks and things without contaminating mm -hmm. it from my hands or whatever else, because they are just everywhere. That's a really good point that it, it, it's it's going to be difficult to say say categorically this is this microbe and it is completely uncontaminated with anything else just because yeah. there's everywhere and there's so many different kinds and yeah. how do you even know if you have gotten rid of all of them you know if your I hands mean, are clean yeah. Well, so that's one of the things why we have specialist equipment in the lab, which obviously I'm now in a medical lab, so I can't really <laughs> play around with the, them there. But uh, there are ways to limit contaminations, but it's always hard. So if you really yeah. want to do it properly, you always have to take like control samples. So like from the environment and things like that. But <clears throat> When I was isolating from soil or, for example, from the mammoth, what we saw is that some species of bacteria and fungus and whatever microbes they are, I mean, it's not always easy to identify them. They like sticking together. And no matter what we tried, we couldn't separate them. And because they are microscopic, mm. you sort of you grow them under one condition and you think, OK, this looks clean. And then you, you go from there and grow them on a different condition. And suddenly you realize it's not a isolated population it's a mixed mm -hmm. population of things so it really depends and it depends how far you want to take it hmm. quickly okay. beyond to that sometimes it's not even possible to get pure culture of one organism because for growth and survival it depends on another microbe mm -hmm. so they sort of go hand in hand and they have to be cultured together wow this is a whole new world um, and this touches a bit on one of the questions that I just saw in the chat, which um, mentions lichens, which are, so that's a mi cultural mix of different microbes. It's not, I mean, I know lichens are used for dyeing and everything. It's not something I've extensively looked at myself, but what I can give as an example for my own um, field is that one of the things we look at a lot is, so I mentioned that, for example, it, depending on the nutrients you supply, the organism with it can produce different colors but we sometimes have a like if we look at the genome the genetics the dna we see that they're capable of producing different chemicals but we can't seem to turn on production in the lab and mm. one of the ways that we're figuring out that the way to turn it on is they need the interaction of other organisms it's not about mm. chemically turning it on it's about the presence of another organism so that sort of links to this lichen idea of, um, and what I also tried to touch on in my presentation is that it's all very linked. It's none of this happens in an isolated environment, which is what we generally do in the lab. So it might not be so bad that you don't necessarily get a pure culture or something, as long as you're aware of what you're doing and why. Okay. Um... We have another question for either or both of you. Is Do you have anything on the iridescent or golden or shine front from microbes and fungi? Um, I don't specifically, like there, there is a lot of work being done on that. Those are generally often 
either structural or more sort of dye type um, chemicals, but it's not something I've I've extensively looked at personally. I don't know about Kabir, but uh, can maybe there, find an uh, example. I haven't been able to find anything for structural color in fungi. Um, that's when light interacts and, and gives you a range of colors. Um, haven't really seen anything, but I will say that I do see mushrooms with metallic sheen on them. Sometimes you'll you'll see uh, patches of amanita that are not typical, and they have that metallic sheen. So I'm not sure what is giving that color, but um, I'm sure it's 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 possible. There is something going on that needs to be um, looked at in more detail, perhaps. Yeah, I was just at a conference in the the campus that I was on. It's, it's just mushrooms, all different kinds of mushrooms popping up everywhere. And there were several varieties that did have kind of a sheen on it or an iridescence or, you know, that almost a metal flake look. Yeah. This is uh, just an example of these colonies of uh, bacteria growing on plates that have this structural uh, iridescent uh, mm. effect going on. But I think that's also, again, not necessarily a single answer because it depends on whether it's coming from the microorganism itself or something that it's producing. Um, we've got another question, and I absolutely love this. It's for both of you. Do you have microbial pigment collections or archives, and what form do they take? I don't have a personal one at the moment. It is what I'm planning on working on, but it's something I have to set up. But generally speaking in the lab, um, the way we do it is we keep them in a minus 80 Celsius degree freezer. <laughs> and we have these extensive um, uh, little tubes and um, extensive libraries and archives. Um, there's also commercial places you can actually just order uh, bacterial or fungal strains from. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things that I'm thinking about, like how to store it and what. Mm -hmm. One of the things is that uh, spore forming bacteria and fungi are usually the easiest to store because once they form a, a spore, they are generally quite stable. Um, but other forms are a lot more susceptible to not surviving in various conditions. So even if you store them at a minus 80 degrees Celsius, uh, some won't survive. You have you have to be aware that you have to reculture them or something. So it's not necessarily the most viable system. So one of the easiest ways would be to just keep culturing, culturing them, but that's obviously a lot of work. So something I'm also thinking about and a bit one of the reasons I'm a bit hesitant to start isolating too much without having a way to keep it. <laughs> Kabir, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I don't have a collection at the moment, but I will tell you this. We have a huge mutant library where genes of this particular pathogen are deleted. And I constantly go back and forth hoping I'll find a unique morphology or a unique color. Unfortunately, I haven't come across anything yet, but my search is ongoing. So if if it ends up being fruitful, it'll probably take the same form where it ends up in a minus 80 freezer um, mm. with, with really nice documentation. Um, let's see. Okay, what happened here? So Felipe was thinking about the pylos layer of trametes that have that shimmer effect. He said he was testing to see if the shimmer lasts longer after grinding um, the opalescent effect. I, do you, either of you know anything about that? Okay. I don't know if and, Kabir has any uh, um, experience with these kind of uh, mushrooms. Yeah, I would say that it's quite a, quite really specific. Uh, 
yeah uh, research question right but uh, that's amazing uh Felipe if you would like to share with us later on feel free to contact us I think mm -hmm. it'll be very very nice uh and very interesting to hear about that well, uh if if anybody ha is working on things like this, you know, get in touch with us and get in touch with Mia and Kabir. And, you know, there's always room for collaboration between, you know, people who are actually in the lab and people who are doing this at home. Frequently, people at home stumble across something that people in the lab haven't thought of yet or seen yeah. yet. Lucy uh, is right. totally into the mutant library. <laughs> <laughs> all yeah, right. so I was just um, writing back that actually those images that I showed of all the different colors of my single type of bacteria, most of those are actually part of my also mutant library where we have mutants that have uh, different chemistry in their metabolic pathways. So actually the way they um, take up and process the chemicals, including nutrients and food, um, the way they process them internally and what they create out of them. the We have a lot of mutants um, of that, and then you start seeing these different colors. Yeah, that's really amazing. Really amazing. I think uh, one last question before we we end this, this con nice conversation is that uh, we all keep saying like a uh, uh, different color due to the chemistry, due to uh, different um, environment, but what kind of relationship can we find like between color and shape? Uh, but when I say shape is not really um, like uh, the classical macroscopic shape, but I would say the way how the crystal structure of those organic molecules or those organic molecules who are stacked together, would they give a different type of color, different shades? Would I have any relationship or correlation between color and shape? Um, I Most of the antibiotics, at least, that I work with, um, a lot of them are actually um, peptides. Um, so these are relatively complex um, chemical structures, but I'm not sure about in terms of like any relationship if they have more conjugations with each other or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, I can maybe show you the chemistry of the red and blue from my streptomyces, but um, yeah, I'm not sure beyond that. I mean, the, chem the chemistry is so diverse um mm -hmm. from for example the melanin to these complex uh antibiotic compounds that then for some reason have a color and i do think in some cases color might just be a byproduct of the chemistry rather than um a real reason for the a biological okay. yeah fair enough fair enough yeah just that would be very interesting to can we tune in the like uh, the type of color by just changing the shape of of the network yeah right. i mean yeah i mean so the way we study these uh is usually i mean it's the biochemical processes so it'll be you'll probably be familiar if you have any experience with uh sort of organic chemistry or things like that these very long pathways of slight variations in chemical compounds and then they can lead off to different types of compounds so the the indigo based colors were one example where just single um chemical co uh, compound uh variations on side chains um can give a completely different color and that's also true for these other compounds but um yeah, their chemistry is just so diverse. Some of these are really huge compounds and others are quite small. Uh, it's really varied. Yeah, that's very nice. All right, I think uh, we are good in time here. So I'd like to thank, uh, thank you everyone for, you know, uh, for the participation and being here with us today. And uh, thank Mia and Kabir 
for this wonderful conversation uh, about color and and biology or microbiology. Uh, and uh, the next talk will be uh, with the Julie Bieler next in early December. So we're going to be like yeah, uh, sending invitations out uh, the next in the next week or so. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you everyone, and uh, I see you in the next talk next month. I just want to add. I just want to add that um, you can get a little jump on our next talk. By going to just Google Julie Beeler, B E B double E L E R. Yeah. She's got, I think, three websites. One is the Mushroom Color Atlas, and one is Bloom and Die. And I can't remember what the other one is off the top of my head. Blow your mind, the work yep. she's doing. Just absolutely blow your mind. <laughs> it's gorgeous. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one of Raph's secrets. He goes to yeah. Julie's website when he's like stressed out with work and all, everything, traveling and stuff. And it's his new Zen space. Yeah, it is really fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Melanie, for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out there. Well, so I really enjoy that. But yeah, yeah. that's absolutely, absolutely. I, I truly, truly enjoy that. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See you. See you around. See you.